Bonjour, mes amis. Welcome to The Rest. It is history. I, Achille Poirot, have invited you here into the library to answer for you a mystery very profound. The fire, it is roaring in the grate. The butler, he is serving the sherry. The fog, it is thick over the mashes that surrounds this lonely manor house where we have all congregated, n'est-ce pas? And what is it I wish to reveal? Why, a mystery very strange. How is it that one English writer has sold more than two billion copies of her novels? What does it say about her life and times? What does it say about us, that we still read and watch adaptations of her novels, even now almost fifty years after her death? I talk, of course, of Madame Agatha Christie. And to explain her, it requires the application of the little Gracelles, the process of the thought logique. But of course, I would not be Hercule Poirot if I did not have a sidekick, a bone-headed Anglo-Saxon. Dominic Sandbrook, that was, of course... (laughs) Agatha Christie's great fictional creation, David Suchet. So, Tom, Tom, this is, so if I'm true to the spirit of that, this is the point at which I launch myself at you, sink my fingers into your neck and shout, you damned interfering <laughs> foreigner, <laughs> or something I, like that. No, I was thinking of you more as kind of Captain Hastings. Well, clearly you do, yeah. In your I think dapper of myself, suit. I think of uh, myself as the murderer. Um, <laughs> well, of course, these are exactly the kind of tricks that Agatha Christie loves to play. That's right. So what we should what we should say right at the beginning, Tom, because we are talking about the, I think we can reasonably say, certainly in commercial terms, the single most successful British writer, probably the single most successful writer of any country in the 20th century. Um, but amazingly, there will be some people who haven't read her books, but maybe want to. So we should probably say at the beginning that there's a spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> we will be giving away, I imagine, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the culprits and the denouements and so on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a great Unapologetically. Subject. Unapologetically. It's a great subject, this, Tom, because we did Sherlock Holmes before. We did James Bond. And I think Agatha Christie, I mean, it's extraordinary that she outsold both Conan Doyle and um, Ian Fleming by a colossal margin. You know, it's, it's one of these things, people try to calculate the number of books sold, but we're talking about hundreds of millions in different languages. And you did it in your splendid kind of belt. I, I assume that's a Belgian accent. Yes, it is. Yes. But course, she's very popular in France, um, incredibly popular in France. They have their own separate adaptations, and French literary critics, as we will probably discuss, have have written glowing tributes to her. So it makes sense to take her seriously. I checked in the Bodleian, and apparently she is the most translated individual author of all time. I can well believe that. Uh, so can... more than Shakespeare or... Well, easier to translate than Shakespeare, yes. I imagine. Yeah. Um, and more accessible, which and, and probably very good if you're learning... Uh, also, if you're learning English. Actually. Right. So that's a question which I'm sure we'll come to is, is that popularity reflective of the global cultural power that Britain had in the 20th century? Mm, um, that's a good I mean, question. I don't, I'm sure we'll come to that. I would also say that, that Agatha Christie is, I mean, it's a classic Sam Brooks subject. <laughs> so a hugely popular, hugely popular yeah. figure who tends to be looked down on by the, the sneery metropolitan elites. Well, that you, true. Dominic, uh, stand firm against. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you say that because some years ago, I mean, about two listeners may remember this. That I did a series on the BBC called, which they ended up calling Let Us Entertain You. This was after I'd persuaded them not to call it Dominic Sandbrook's Pleasure Island, which was their, <laughs> which was their original title. <laughs> that, I mean, that, imagine yeah. being trapped by a storm on Dominic <laughs> Sandbrook's Pleasure Island. A terrifying With a prospect. homicidal <laughs> maniac on the loose. A terrible. Talking to you about Stanley Baldwin. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so they that. didn't call it that. And it was basically about British culture in the 20th century, the British imagination and its export overseas. And um, I wrote a tie-in book and, and – for that called uh, the Great British Dream Factory, which I'm holding up now as I oh, talk to you, Dominic. No one can see it. No, Tom, I know, it's nice but, that you're holding I'm it up for me to see. up an image using the power of words. And, and I, I kicked off the discussion of Agatha Christie in that by listing some of the things that people have said about her. So the American critic Edmund Wilson, for example, said her prose is of a mawkishness and banality, which seems to me almost in, literally impossible to read. 
Bernard Levin said, her books are unreadable rubbish, not one of them worth the time of an intelligent adult. Ruth Rendell, who obviously was later on a kind of rival of Agatha Christie, or successor and rival, said, when I read an Agatha Christie, I don't feel as though I have a piece of fiction worthy of the name in front of me. And basically, people have always looked down on Agatha Christie and sneered at her and sort of guardian columnists. I, they, I, I was waiting for you to take use the phrase guardian columnists. <laughs> and there it is. Because so everyone tons- playing Dominic Sandbrook, bingo. Bingo, yeah. Because <laughs> if, if you search on the Guardian website and their comment pages, there are tons of attacks on Agatha Christie saying it's nostalgic, <laughs> it's snobbish, it's yeah. this, that and the other. Um, all of which actually at the time in the books, it's not. It's not nostalgic because it's set very much in the here and now. And it's not snobbish because she doesn't look down on, as it were, the lower orders. So as I say, the dream, uh, Dominic Sandbrook subject, and you're brilliant at this. You're absolutely brilliant at this, at picking up on hugely popular figures who are looked down upon and certainly persuading me, as you did in um, uh, The Great British Dream Factory, uh, and and persuaded me that we should do this subject. Does that mean, Tom, that one day we can do a podcast about Catherine Cookson? Uh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure about that. No, because I don't think she's, I don't think, I, I agree that Agatha Christie, her fame and her popularity yeah. is in itself, um, you know, these are these are historically intriguing details that are worthy yeah. of study. I also think that that in and of herself, her, her relationship to her work is very interesting. Well, she's a good, the 20th century, Tom, she's a great window into the 20th century. I was only reading there that the, earlier today an essay by John Lanchester. You must be a big admirer. I mean, he's a brilliant critic, John Lanchester, and he says in that um, one of Christie's subjects is the 20th century, and actually you can trace it through her books from the Mysterious Affair of Styles, which was first published in 1920 in America, to the last books, which are not as good really, published in the 1970s. But you can track the social and cultural changes through the fiction, and they're very they're very subtle, but they're there, and it's right. a really interesting way to to think about British culture in the 20th well, century. Well, if top critics who write for the London Review of Books agree with you, then exactly, we're absolutely onto a winner here. We are, we are. We're, we're pleasing the highbrows and the lowbrows. How we like it. <laughs> it is. So I think that, um, I mean, I, I agree. Let's, let's look at Agatha Christie as a mirror held up to the 20th century, but probably um, it would be best to look at uh, the life of, of, of Agatha Christie herself, because I think there are clues there. Oh, you're going to, I hope you're going to keep slipping into this because that will make <laughs> that will not be irritating at all for the audience no, right. and, okay i and, think that uh, there are clues yeah. in no, 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 uh, in her, up, in her up. upbringing <laughs> and, and the two two i think two particularly seismic events in her life that seem to have um do i have to ask through her i have to ask hasting style now <laughs> but what could they be Poirot? <laughs> ah my friend um well i i think the first yeah. is uh her um her relationship to her parents. So she's born 1890 yep. in uh, uh, Torquay. Yeah, the English and Riviera. The English Riviera. <laughs> yeah. Famous for its brilliant hotels. Um, and, and actually hotels along the Devon coast are, are quite a theme of her fiction. They are. Um, but her parents are, so her father is American and her, her mother is British. Yeah, that's right. born mother, in Dublin. Think, yes, um, from Ireland, exactly. But but yeah, she's very. It's a very kind of genteel upbringing. So I think they have, um, you know, conservatories and a tennis court and yes, maids and, and libraries and things. Yeah, all yeah. this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. sort of upper middle class, I suppose you'd say they are. But then when her when um, Agatha is and she's Agatha Miller, when she yeah. is eleven, her father dies and they are left financially embarrassed, basically. So there is yes. there's a kind of I mean it's not it's not like they become poverty stricken, but it's it's uncomfortable for someone used to upper middle class life that they have to start economizing and all these kind of things. And that clearly leaves in, 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 uh, in her mind, the memory of what, of, of how important money is, of how significant social gradations are, all these kind of things that will feed into her fiction. I think that's very, very astute, Tom. I think. Do money, you think the little gray cells there? Have... I think the little gray cells have, <laughs> have been absolutely vindicated because I think um, she absolutely is aware of the instability and it might seem an odd thing to say about upper middle class life, but of course, so many people are sort of trying to keep up appearances, as it were, yeah, and playing playing the parts expected of them, which is a big theme of Agatha Christie's books. And if you think, as you say, what are we when she's eleven, nineteen oh one? So yeah. Edwardian England, you know, keeping up appearances, putting on, you know, uh, this is the era of the Kaiser having the wrong deck shoes, very much yeah. a favourite theme of the rest is history, yeah. and. Um, <laughs> 
and 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 I think that that underpins so much that the social anxiety um, of the upper middle classes in the twentieth century is a, is a key part of the of the sort of world of her fiction. But also that sense that everything can go away, can can melt and dissolve. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and when I um. When you mentioned um, that <laughs> the BBC originally wanted to call your series Dominic Island's Pleasure Island, which yeah. is su- uh, that's a detail I will never forget. You know, they also wanted to call it Tom. No, well, uh, they wanted to call it at one point. They wanted to call it. I'm not kidding. They really wanted to call it for your pleasure. <laughs> I said, it's like a Durex advert. That's exactly what I said. I said that's the that's written on machines in the gentlemen's toilets. I mean, no, you cannot okay. call it that. Okay, but when when you when you mentioned, I said, uh, imagine being trapped on that island with a homicidal maniac on the loose. Of course, they're never homicidal maniacs. It's, she's not actually that that kind of writer. No. They are always people. I mean, that's the whole thing, isn't it? That they are people generally from the middle classes, and they are hiding things. Yeah, that's why it's wrong to say that they're that they're kind of paranoid snobbish books, as some of her critics have done, because the killers, as you say, are, are not. You know, there's no fear of the lower orders in the books. The fear comes from within, from yep. within the sort of yep. the middle classes. And, and actually, you're completely right, Tom. That people are often motivated by by secrets, by a kind of grinding, gnawing anxiety about losing, about being exposed, or something like that. And my money. And I mean, my money, money is by by far the single biggest motivation. But, um, of killers in Agatha Christie's books. But the second would be sexual desire, outward yeah. jealousy or uh, people being spurned or whatever. And that, of course, um, is the second <laughs> uh, terrible experience that Agatha Christie goes through. And I say Agatha Christie rather than Agatha Miller because um, she marries a guy called Archibald That's right, uh, Christie, Arch- Archie Christie, who is very dashing, isn't he? So she meets him at a, a ball um, outside Torquay in, I think, 1912, checking my notes from the Bodleian. <laughs> <laughs> very good. He time. proposes in 1913. Uh, and of course, in 1914, um, the war breaks out, and he is in the um, air force. He's going to. He's in the Royal Flying Corps. He's exactly, he's a real Corps. pioneer, but also that's a. He's that's a very dashing thing to be yeah. in the Great War. I mean, so he, it, she's a done moustache. I assume moustache. I think he, and... I imagine him with a moustache. Yeah. I imagine him as a sort of. Yeah, well, he he becomes quite a sort of rakish figure in the kind of Christie imagination, mythology, obviously he, yeah. mythology because of his behaviour in the 1920s. But um, he must have been a tremendous catch. So. Agatha had been a very shy and always was incredibly shy, kind of bookish. She didn't go to school. She was kind of self-taught. She sort of you know, reads all these books in her father's library. And she goes to parties and things. Somebody says to her at one point, or says to her mother, your daughter is a beautiful dancer, but she doesn't know how to talk. Um, but obviously Archie Christie is a great catch. So they're married. She works as a as a volunteer nurse in the first world war which i think is massively important where she learns about poisons and she learns about poisons but also and she's she's clearing up you know cleaning up servicemen stuff yeah. covered in blood i mean she talks at one point she gave an interview one of the only interviews she ever gave was to the imperial war museum and um she talked in that about um picking up basically bits of people and you know putting them into but, the furnace but that kind of i mean that kind of gore is not a feature of the novels is it no and it wouldn't I mean, they wouldn't be successful if it if um, it was actually yeah i think it's the your, the 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 death is always I mean, there is neat. no Hannibal Lecter. There's no, definitely not. But yeah, so then she she writes. I mean, we can come back to the fiction in a second. But she her, her first book, Mysterious Affair, at Stars, is 1920 in America, and then published in 1921 in in Britain, and that introduces uh, Poirot. Poirot, and we can come back to Poirot, I think, as well as as a refugee character. But then, so she writes a series of books in the 1920s. I think there's so much actually to be said about. Why the twenties? Why is it that Agatha Christie is successful at this Go point on. in what, time? What, what is? Do you want to do that now, or do you want to get on to the sex? Okay, let's get on to the sex, and then we'll come. Back to that. <laughs> Tom, Tom yeah. Holland, I know how his mind works. So she's quite a successful writer. She's had a great hit with the murder of Roger Ackroyd, which is arguably the single greatest detective novel of all time. She's thirty-six years old, and she and Archie—he's a stockbroker, and they live in Sunningdale in Berkshire. Real kind of home county stockbroker belt. And real kind of everything that you would expect on a Sunday evening ITV crime drama. Yeah, absolutely. You know, home counties, stockbroker, yeah. and seething sexual jealousy. <laughs> yes. I, well, this is, and this is what you clearly wanted to get onto, Tom. So they've had, they've kind of grown apart. He played, spends all his time playing golf and, and in the city. And he basically, they have a row and he's just said to her, um, I'm actually, I've fallen in love with my golfing partner who's called Nancy Neal. Now, a fantastic fact, Tom, 
is that one of our listeners is related to Nancy Neal. Oh, really? Because uh, he sent me a message when Who's he that? found out. He's called John Browning. He's a member of the Rest is History Club, which you too so can join at uh, restishistorypod.com. So, so he gave us a brilliant opportunity for advertising our club. But oh, also, definitely. he says um, Nancy Neal uh, was the other woman, and she was my maternal grandmother's cousin. Goodness. They were both the daughters of railway officials, and their, uh, and their father was a senior railway officer who took charge of Queen Victoria's railway travel from London to Carlisle when she went to Balmoral. I remember my grandmother saying that her cousin's husband had previously been married to Agatha Christie, but she never mentioned the scandal. Well, probably not surprisingly. So anyway, yes. So Nancy Neal is the other woman. And Agatha, on the night of the 3rd of December, 1926, she goes upstairs to kiss their seven-year-old daughter goodnight. And then she comes back downstairs and she gets in the car, which is, I think, a Morris. And then she disappears. Amazing. And the car is found abandoned. Yeah, by sort of gravel pit or something. Yeah. I can't remember, a clay pit or something of that kind. And um, 10 days go by and it's this colossal media sensation. So um, people send the newspapers. Of course, it's the heyday of the kind of popular press of the sort of the, the, the Harmsworth press empire and so on. So they all get involved. Um, they hire Dorothy L. Sayers. <laughs> arrival to visit her house looking for clues psychics uh, they get don't they so arthur think, conan doyle very yeah. i mean he consults a medium <laughs> <Arthur> fairies <laughs> yeah he consults but i mean arthur conan doyle at this stage in his life consults his medium to tell him what pair of trousers to yeah. put on so i mean yeah uh massive press sensation lots of people say it's a stunt or that she's dead or archie has murdered her or you know who knows and then 10 days later famously she turns up in the um swan hydro hotel in harrogate um, under an assumed name. And she's basically spent the last 10 days playing bridge and dancing and doing all this stuff with the other guests. But the weird thing, Tom, as you may know, is that the assumed name she takes on is Mrs. Neal. Yeah. She, in other words, she names herself after the other woman. And people have never worked out really whether it, it was um, designed to embarrass So Archie. what do you think? Because there are many theories on this, aren't there? And they've never um, been conclusively, conclusively answered. It's really hard to say. Some kind of breakdown, I guess. A, a, a breakdown coupled with possibly an attempt to, you know, maybe she's hoping that her husband will come and kind of rescue her and come to his senses or something. Um, or maybe it's something she embarked on and then once she'd embarked on it, you know, in the sort of moment yeah. of madness, yeah. then she was stuck with it. She couldn't kind of, after two yeah. days, say, she just thought, God, I'm going to have to brazen this out and carry on doing this for weeks. I don't know. It's impossible. But also I mean, maybe she never the, talked the, about the it. The degree to which she writes about these kind of dramas, and then yeah. she finds herself kind of trapped in one. The love triangle, which is so well, often a theme. Okay, so so here is my here's my theory on this. So in preparation for this, I read two of her her greatest works: uh, Murder on the Nile, Death on the and, Nile. Tom, sorry, Death on the Nile. <laughs> God, <laughs> and um, Poirot, Evil, under the, Evil under the Sun. <laughs> Evil under the Sun. Yeah. Uh, and they're both written, I think, kind of 39, 41, something like that. I mean, yes. so yeah, around the beginning of, right. the, of, the, of the Second World War. And massive spoiler alerts, if you haven't read them or seen them and you would like to, uh, just blank this bit out. But basically, the plot of both of them revolve around a couple. Yeah. The husband or the, the, the fiancé or the, the male partner seems to run off with a much more glamorous, wealthier, sexually attractive woman. Yeah. Who then dies, who, get, who gets murdered. Yes. And it turns out that all along, the male partner has, has actually stayed faithful to his original female partner. Yeah. And both of them have, have teamed up together to commit the murder. It's a trick to kill the, 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 the woman that you think is the, the other woman who's stolen him. Yeah. And actually, all along, it's, it's the other woman who ends up dead. I mean, that's kind of very, very interesting. It seems to me applying my little grey cells. <laughs> oh, um, as back. Great. But also, of course, uh, you know, they are murderers. So there's a certain degree of kind of wish fulfillment there, but also a, a feeling of guilt, perhaps, that you are engaging in the wish fulfillment. Am I being, am I being too psychologically? Tom, I actually, once again, I um, <laughs> now uh, we're recording this on a day where somebody on Twitter said, whenever I'm, I, I say you're being very generous, Tom, or something like that. It means I think you're talking absolute rubbish. But actually, I think you're, you're dead right. I hadn't thought of that before, but I think it's so. The portrait of the killers in both those books, Death and the Nile, it's a, it's very kind of double edged, isn't it? Because mm. the um, it is wishful film, but at the same time, there is a dread of the of the character 
of the sort of raffish, yeah. you know, sexually attractive male. And the, the um, in in Evil Under the Sun, the 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 woman who um turns out to be complicit in the murder, but is yeah. presented in a kind of very positive light. Um, but she she doesn't tan, she doesn't go. That's right. She's yeah. bookish. Um, yeah. So she's, she's a bit of a self-portrait, you think? A, a, a bit, except, of course, that Agatha Christie is also famous as a surfer, isn't she? So, A surfer? Yeah. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Like a, like a surfer as in? As in the Beach Boys. As in Big Sur or something yeah. in California. Yeah, there's a famous photo of her clutching a surfboard. <laughs> is that? Yes. I've never seen this. <laughs> well, you're the... <laughs> Well, wow. you you're the top historian of Agatha Christie. You must have seen it. No, that. well, I'm clearly not. Well, maybe I'm imagining that. I, no, I need, no, no, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go and check that. I thought, I think she did. But I think, I think um, the 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 idea of the kind of the bookish, uh, ma- almost mousy, yeah, white skinned, uncharismatic, poor kind of church mouse who yeah. then turns out to be, um, you know, to have, have have kept her man and to be a murderer. I don't know. I just wonder if perhaps there's a certain degree of That's complicated nice. I like that. visual But also that takes us back to the climates of the 20s when the book started, because the sort of small scale nature of them, I think, is really important to their success. And that's those sort of characters. So Poirot himself is is kind of like that, Tom, in the sense that, of course, he's he's larger than life in lots of ways. But I always think with Poirot. So Poirot Do you want to just in, describe him for people who may not have so read So Poirot is, what is he, five foot four or something. He's um, Head like he's an very, egg. He's, He's very round. He has a head like an egg. He is a Belgian refugee. To make him a Belgian refugee is so daring in 1920. Uh, to, today, when you watch the David Suchet's, he seems a nostalgic, backward-looking figure. But it's the equivalent of making him, you know, a Syrian refugee or a Ukrainian refugee today. Mm-hmm. He's a contemporary. He's a very contemporary figure. He lives in a brand new flat. His flat is often sort of. You know, it's described as all geometrically arranged. Which they get very, very well in the in the sushi. The they do sushi. perfectly. They yeah. perfectly. Um, everything has to be just so. He's utterly unheroic. He's physically unprepossessing. He's he he's frightened of kind of paddling. I remember. Of I remember a, there was a brilliant thing where he had to um, in the David Suchet one where he had to cross a stile, <laughs> and and you you could see him. The look of horror, yeah, <laughs> on David Suchet's face, and then he kind of waddles off down the side of the. He's always the worried about field. getting his his kind of patent leather shoes his spats dirty in his yeah. spats. But in 1920, all of that is really bracing because the detectives that you're used to are Sherlock Holmes and the and his imitators, Sherlock Holmes and his rivals. So they're all sort of quite tall, beaky men in kind of massive tweed coats who are always kind of herring after hounds on moors. Down sewers. Yeah, or, or like they, yeah. they, they want a blue for pugilism at Cambridge yeah. or something. Yeah. And Poirot is absolutely not from that cloth. So he, I always think he is a detective for an age, a post-First World War age, that is nervous about kind of masculine heroics um, and about violence and about the gallant hero and all yep. those kinds of things. But he's also an outsider. He's an outsider, absolutely. And this is why one of the really interesting, uh, interestingly foolish things that people say about Agatha Christie is so foolish. They say, well, she's xenophobic. But actually, a time and again in Christie's books, people say, that damned foreigner, what is he, a Frenchman or something? Mm. And they are the, they look that like they're either made to look like fools or they're the murderer or they're exposed as a sort of oafish yeah. reactionary. Um, Christie is very clever in, in her portrayal of Englishness is often um, there's a sort of edge to it. And I think that's one of the reasons incidentally why he's so popular in France because like Poirot is a character, but also Christie is a novelist because, you know, if you're a, uh, it, it paints in many ways quite an unflattering picture yeah, it does. Yeah. of kind of um, British self-satisfaction, complacency, introversion, all those kinds of things. Well, I, I, it's a very interesting example of this, and it wasn't about um, xenophobia, but it was about sexism. Yeah. Uh, watching um, Evil Under the Sun yesterday, so I read the novel and then watched the adaptation of it by Andy Horowitz, very good. And I was watching it with um, Katie, my daughter, and the portrayal of the the murderee, the, the kind of oh, yeah. glamorous other woman who ends up um, being murdered and lots of people say oh she's an evil figure you know she's destroying the marriage she's a man-eater uh she's going to get murdered she's going to deserve all she gets 
And Katie said, oh, you know, I, I'm not sure about that. I don't think you should be. Were you in danger of being cancelled in your own household, Tom? Well, she, she, she was picking up on something that, that was, you know, it was sexist. It was a sexist yeah. approach. And because it was Agatha Christie and because it was set when it was, it was entirely, you know, you could imagine, yes, this is, this is a, you know, this is the attitude that you, the viewer or the reader are meant to have. But of course, it, this turns out to be sand thrown in your eyes, dust thrown in your eyes, because actually it turns out that, you know, Poirot says she is a victim. She's always been a victim. She hasn't been a man eater. She's been ripped off. You know, predatory men have stolen all her money. And yeah. it turns, you know, you are, she deceives you and she, she kind of panders to people's prejudices. I think that's and then absolutely right. Kind of turns them on the head. And she does that with, with, with um, kind of British chauvinism as well. She does it again and again. And I think that's one of the really interesting things that uh, people often say about Christie. Well, her books are full of stereotypes, kind of vicars, doctors, you know, as you say, man eating women, all these kinds of things. But so often she'll feed you the stereotype. Um, but that's, but th that's a trick. Yeah. And, and she's playing actually with your expectations. She knows that you, you are carrying so much baggage and then she sort of pulls the rug out from under you. And I think what's really also interesting in the context of she's writing between the wars in a period of great social change. And then of course, some of her best books in the 1940s amid the sort of turmoil of the second world war. And then the labor government in Britain, the, the sort of the Attlee government all the time, these people are conscious that the sort of plates are shifting under their feet and you don't really know who anybody is. Yeah. You know, new people are moving in the old guard have lost power, all of this kind of thing. And they, they talk again and again, you know, I don't know those people who bought the house down the road. I, they say they were in, you know, the East, but I don't, you know, that sort of thing. And then it turns out there's all kinds of secrets and sort mm -hmm. of assumed identities and kind of love children and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and sons behaving badly to parents and, and so on. Yeah. Young tension between the generations. Yeah. I think, I think we should take a break at this point. Uh, and I think that when we come back, we should look perhaps at um, ancient history and Christianity. What oh, Tom, <laughs> that's absolutely scandalous behavior. Yes. All right. We'll see you after the break. Hello, welcome back. We are looking at uh, Agatha Christie as a mirror held up to the 20th century. Um, but I promised that we would look at two intriguing themes, ancient history and Christianity. Yeah. Uh, Dominic, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, am I? And they are both significant. Well, ancient history, because of course, she married an archaeologist. Um, so after the Archie thing all blew up, she then married the archaeologist Max Malawan. And people were very unkind because she was, I think, 14 years his Yes, it's Macron-esque. Well, I, I was going to say by Macron standards, I mean, <laughs> they're, they're practically born in the same month. Um, and um, and people used to say, oh, well, you know, Max is interested in old relics and archaeologists <laughs> are only interested in you, the older you are and stuff. But actually they had a very, seems to be a very contented marriage. And she would accompany him on these incredible groundbreaking mid-century um, archaeological digs in kind of well she she met him she was out in iraq with uh, leonard woolley who that's right excavated earth i mean he's yeah. very very um high and she she'd always been interested in that because she when she left school her mother was ill um and this you know as with lord carnarvon going to to egypt you go to egypt if you are um you know you're you're, you're a bit seedy a bit under the weather go and spend the winter months in uh, yeah. luxor or cairo um, and so she goes with um, with her mother to Cairo when she's about 18. And I think it has obviously a, a kind of huge impact on her. So I'm sure that, that that is kind of an aspect of why she she falls for Max Malawan, who um, I I cited in Persian Fire. He wrote a Did very you? good article on Cyrus the Great. This is a brilliant opportunity for you to advertise your book, <laughs> Persian Fire, yeah, Tom. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, um, and also she, she, wrote, um, she wrote a play about Akhenaten, friend of the show, which is terrible. Oh no! It's terrible. Oh, so basically, basically, it's um, it's it's a, a kind of standard Agatha Christie murder novel transplanted to the 18th dynasty. So you've got Horam Heb, who is the, uh, the the general under Akhenaten, um, who is described as being a Pukka Saab. So he's oh, right. he's like a kind of you know the 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 colonel who's a bore <laughs> about Simla and Puna, <laughs> yeah, and all that. And um, his wife um, Mut Nodjmet. <laughs> It's, she she undulates her body menacingly. Oh is, no! Is one of the one of the stage descriptions. I'd happily see um, that. And she's uh, she's very she's very snooty about um, Queen T, who holds on to her old fashioned uh, fashions of dress. 
So is this an adaptation? Because Chrissy wrote one of her whodunits, Death Comes as the End, I think it was, was set in ancient Egypt. Is yeah. this an adaptation of that? No, it's different. Oh, right. It's, so it's she, literally about Tutankhamun and all that. So she dabbled stuff. twice in yeah. ancient Egypt. Yeah. And But of course, some of her books are set. So Murder in Mesopotamia is set on an archaeological dig, and there's supposedly a portrait in that of Leonard Woolley's wife. Yeah. who clearly was not highly regarded by the other archaeologists. <laughs> yeah. um, and Death on the Nile, there's a murder attempt at um, the great statues of Ramses II at Abu Simbel. That's right. And actually, uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about Christian is that her books t- basically take place in two different kinds of places. They take place in rural England, in rural, in sort of St. Mary Mead or Chipping Cleghorn and these sort of invented... Mm, or I- islands. Yeah, or, or off, islands. Off Cornwall. Off, yeah, or islands of Devon and sort of stuff. But also they take place in what you might call, I suppose, the it's the decaying mid-century British imperial periphery. So it's yeah. place, it's, it, they don't tend to be in British colonies, but they're places that are kind of maybe informal colonies. Of yeah, the so British. Egypt or Mesopotamia. Egypt, exactly. Yeah. Or people travelling back, i.e. murder on the Orient Express. Um, they're sort of, you know, the Stamboul train kind of thing. Mm. Um, and that obviously adds to their appeal, the exoticism. So the ancient history, I think, I mean, that gives her another string to her bow that none of her competitors have, Dorothy L. Sayers and uh, Marjorie Allingham and so on, who are so rooted in the sort of the cut glass. I mean, they've got all detectives, Lord Peter Whimsey and people like that, who've dated, I think, very badly because they're so firmly rooted in the world of the sort of interwar, you know, sort of British high society um, in that world. But then, Tommy, you want to talk about Christianity. Now, lots of people won't will be wondering how you're going to get Christianity in, but I think I know how you're going to do it. It's, it's important, isn't it, in, within the, um, the moral world of, of the detective novel. Yeah. Christy writes, both with Poirot and with Miss Marple, that there is good and evil, that there is right or wrong, that there are absolute moral standards, and that in a sense, that framework of, of morality is it's the kind of philosophical equivalent to the, the island on which everyone is stuck or the the manor house the, that's been cut ple- off by the, the pleasure fog. island the pleasure, the pleasure island. island exactly so it it's not as though kind of nietzschean superheroes are going to be part of the plot who 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 deride conventional standards of morality and think there is nothing wrong with killing say you know there is no i said there was no hannibal lecter it's precisely the fact that there is no hannibal lecter there is no serial killer there is never anyone i think i i i probably haven't read enough agatha christie's to be absolutely firm about this but by and large the murderers accept the moral frameworks, the moral standards. Yeah. And these moral standards are Christian because Agatha Christie was actually quite a devout Christian. Well, she is a devout Christian. She's a quiet, she's a quiet Christian. She's not kind of tub thumping, but I think it is, I think it is significant and important to explain the style of detective fiction that she's, that she does. So there is an argument, Tom, that detective fiction, I mean, detective fiction comes into being in the mid Victorian period. Um, and you could make an argument, I suppose, that detective fiction comes into being. It obviously expresses all kinds of anxieties about an urban, mobile society where crime can strike at any moment and you don't know who's done it, you know, because you don't know, because you 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 feel discombobulated by the modern world. Um, you, I suppose you could argue that a detective is a, you, a substitute for the judgment of God, the, the yeah. you know, the sort of divine authority. I mean, Poirot, Miss Marvel. Poirot is often like that, isn't he? They, yeah. they absolutely, they have a kind of knowledge that nobody else does. They kind of, an omniscience almost. I mean, there's often a moment in a Poirot book, quite early on, where Poirot will say to Hastings, I know who did it. I merely need to talk to four different people and wait for three other crimes <laughs> before mm-hmm. I can assemble people in the library. But I know, all you need to know is three things, the drop of wax, the timetable, and the fact that he placed a bet on so and so to win the three thirty at yeah. Aintree, and that's all you need to know. And you, you know that there's a godlike figure. Um, and interestingly, Christie, so she believes in the death penalty. Miss Marple in four fifty at Paddington, which is nineteen fifty seven. So there's a moratorium for the death penalty in the nineteen fifties. And Miss Marple says of the killer, "I'm really very, very sorry they've abolished capital punishment because if it's anyone I think ought to hang, it is the villain." Um, Christy herself says in her autobiography, um, people who kill are evil. Um, even if they might deserve pity, you cannot spare them any more than you could spare the man who staggers out from a plague stricken village in the middle ages to mix with innocent and healthy children in a nearby village. (laughs) Not wearing his Uh, mask. Um, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And actually the fascinating thing I think it was about Christy and her 
and her Christianity and the world wars and the era of the world wars in which she's writing is that so often there are conversations in her books about evil. So an evil under the sun, I mean, the title, you know, e evil is foregrounded. But Tom, there's that brilliant moment that you must surely have enjoyed where there's the vicar at the beginning. I know we have a lot of vicars who listen to this podcast, the Reverend Tim Vasby Burney, the Reverend Marcus Walker and so on. There's the vicar who's kind of absolutely obsessed with evil, isn't there? Yes, but he, but 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 his obsession with evil is one of the things that might make him a suspect. Yeah, because people think he's a maniac. He, well, he's a he's a maniac, isn't Monsieur he? Monsieur Poirot, he's... evil is real. It is a fact. I believe in evil like I believe in good. It exists. It's powerful. It walks the earth. He stopped. His breath was coming fast. He wiped his forehead with his handkerchief and looked suddenly apologetic. I'm sorry, I got carried away. He said, "Tom, that's just like." That's what, I, that's what I'm like when I'm listening to, when I'm listening to you. <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I think that's a little harsh because he is going on about kind of painted Jezebels and yeah, that's true. Uh, he's accusing um, the, uh, the murdery in Evil Under the Sun of, be, of being evil. And of course, he turns out not to be evil. That's the whole, yeah. that's the whole twist. So he's, he's part of that kind of um, the, the dust thrown in the eyes. Um, but Poirot does not deny that there is evil. No, he agrees that there is evil, and Poirot and Marple you know, both say again and again there is such yeah. a thing as evil. Um, but yeah. what's really interesting, so in this sort of Pleasure Island <laughs> series, one of the conceits of it was that we were going to be tracing back um, everything to Dickens, and uh, actually, as it turned out, Dickens was Agatha Christie's favourite writer, and Dickens, of course, portrays evil as well, and also Dickens is one of the great progenitors of Detective yeah, Inspector Bucket and Inspector Bleak Bucket in Bleak House. But in Dickens, evil is always expressed kind of physically. So you, you're a dwarf. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, must, yes, you writhe. You've got a hunchback yeah. or whatever, yeah. rather yeah. like in Shakespeare or something. Mm -hmm. But in Agatha Christie, the whole point about evil is that some of the really evil people are otherwise absolutely well-adjusted, sensible, normal characters. You know, it's not like Ian Fleming, where they've all got three yeah. ands or, hair, or they're too hairy or something. Yeah. You know, the, the, the criminal masterminds. And actually, that's the fascinating thing, I think, because the 20th century, in 20th century culture generally, I think especially in mid-century when Christie was writing, it's full of stuff about the evil that lurks within us. You know, all the kind of Lord of the Flies kind, yeah. of, kind of stuff. Or indeed, Gollum in The Lord of the Rings. And um, so, so Christie, again and again, characters say, so there's one in a, no, there's a book called Appointment with Death, and there's a French psychologist called Dr. Girard, and he says, there are such strange things buried down in the unconscious, a lust for power, a lust for cruelty, a savage desire to tear and rend. We shut the door on them and we deny them conscious life, but sometimes they are too strong. And that kind of... Um, well, yes. That, I mean, admittedly, a lot of people would be distracted by that quite superb accent. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, that's the kind of stuff you would expect from a French psychologist. But she believes it and Poirot believes she, it. She, well, and Miss Marple believes it. Because yeah. actually, Miss Marple is one of the kind of the, the, the bleakest fictional creations of the 20th century. I mean, she, <laughs> Dolly, that's a big claim. <laughs> she suspects that everywhere she looks, there is evil. Yeah. And she always turns out to be right. And what she sees is the eve. The, it's almost, it, I know this is an absolutely love, but people will say this is a terrible misuse of the phrase. But she sees the banality of evil. Hmm. So she looks at the goings on in a village. And she says, I can see the hatred, the jealousy, the resentment, the greed that festers in even the most ordinary household. Um, so actually, when you read those, especially, I mean, I read them when I was a teenager, absolutely adored them because I wanted to know who, who did it. But now reading them later and thinking about people reading these books, because the Miss Marple books tend to, the best ones are written basically in the 1940s. Thinking about people reading them at the same time, the moving finger or something. They're reading them at the same time that they're reading the newspapers about these dreadful horrors going on during the Second World War and its aftermath. Um, it's it's really, there is a bleakness there, I think. Yes, uh, but there is also a kind of um, compassion that I think also goes back to the Christianity, perhaps. So I pocket full of rye. Have you read that? Yeah. Um, the killer was Peter Davison in the BBC adaptation in the 1980s, which I was a Doctor Who fan. I found very, mm, very disappointing. Very, very shocking. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that, that's a Miss Marple. The, so the, the plot seems to revolve around the, um, you know, four and 20 blackbirds baked in a pie and all that kind of thing. And among the, the, the king is in his counting house, counting out his money. The queen is in the, what was it? Parlor making bread yeah. and honey. The maid was hanging out the washing. That's right. Yes. 
the maid gets killed. The maid's called Gladys, I think, isn't she? Is the maid's like always that? called Gladys, <laughs> as in, uh, why didn't they ask Evans? Um, and, and in the adaptation I saw, she has a kind of clothes peg. Is, is that the one with the Peter Davidson? A yeah, kind of clothes peg is. stuck on her nose. And she's kind of humiliated and it, it, it's awful. And the whole plot revolves basically around Miss Marple's determination that this maid, who it turns out has been very, very badly emotionally abused, yeah, she's, that's right. she's, By the she's, killer. she's a foundling. Uh, she, she's been working for Miss Marple uh, and she's gone off to the big house and basically she gets completely fooled and. Well, she's groomed, isn't she? She's, and groomed. she's groomed. She's groomed. And that, that for Miss Marple is the true evil. Not just that she's been murdered, but that she's been, she's been groomed and abused. Because that kind of contradicts the, the uh, Christie is a snob. No, definitely not a snob. I mean, that's, you know, that's, I, well, you can see the, the, the debt to Dickens there. Because that's exactly the kind of thing that would have infuriated Dickens as well. Yeah, that's nice, actually. Yes. I, I mean, Christie, it's interesting, isn't it, that people have this attitude to Christie in Britain uniquely, I think, of, of stamping on Christie, because they don't have it abroad. I mean, I was reading some of the French right, critics. So let's, that's great. OK, so we've done Christie the Christian. Now let's do Christie the post-structuralist. Yeah, well, Christie the modernist. So, I mean, there are, there are arguments by, I mean, I know some British listeners will be at this point, you know, either have switched off or just be apoplectic with disbelief. But, you know, people like Roland Barthes, Jacques Barzin, uh, the novelist Michel, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce his name, actually. Um, Huelebeck, is it? I've never yeah, read Huelbeck. it. Michel yeah. Huelebeck. I mean, yeah. they're massive Christie fans. And what they see in Christie, the, the French critics, they say she's a, 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 a um, as you say, Tom, she is a, a, a master of form, of pure kind of she literary really, form. She really, really is. I wrote an essay about her. Did you? So yeah. we're talking about the great critics of our time, mm. and you've, you've included I, I yourself in that number. I wrote a structuralist essay on her. Did you? Because certain certain of the of the novels have the plotting, the structure has a kind of a, a stark purity that no one will ever better. Wow, that's a pretty, that's a so uh, massive spoilers coming up. Yeah, the th- whole thing with a genre, a genre of is that there are rules. Yeah, and you can either go with the rules or you can break them. So whether it's a, a you know a vampire novel or a Wild West novel or a detective novel, there have yeah. to be rules. That's oh, indeed, the a history actually, Tom. That's true of a history book, right? Yeah. I mean, readers, yeah, but readers have complete expectations when yeah. we write our books of the way we're going to structure it. You know, we're not going to suddenly enter the story at some point in a like a sort of Martin Amis character or something. Yeah. So with the detective novel, you can push it to certain levels beyond which it will fragment and and and, and break yeah. up. And the murder of Roger Ackroyd, which you mentioned, has, and has, I think, been repeatedly voted the greatest no- detective novel of all time. The, the twist in that, and again, massive spoiler alert, is yeah. that it is the narrator who is the murderer. And once you've done that, no one else can ever do that. Yeah. It's, it's been right. done. Yeah. And Murder on the Orient Express, it, it turns out to be everybody. Yeah. Again, once you've done that, nobody can ever do that. The Mousetrap, the longest running play uh, of all time. It turns out to be the detective. And yeah. I think her best-selling novel, Then There Were None, which was very awkwardly titled in its original iteration, got yes. renamed. That then turned out to be awkward. And so now it's, uh, and then there were none. But there's, a, again, a kind of stark purity to that, that there are 10 people trapped on an island and one by one they all die. And there is a solution to it. Yeah. But having to present the solution almost kind of, it, it, it destroys the formal beauty of the structure of that plot well not least because actually that that so it's not just that that's formally beautiful but it's also the sort of ideology as it were um reinforces what we were saying earlier she basically takes a cross-section of society and puts them on this traps them on this pleasure island (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, and uh they all die no it's it's not just that they all die it's that they're all killers they're all sinners i mean that's the great except one that's the revelation which then turns out to be but yeah. that's the kind of revelation, though, isn't it? That they all appear to be, yeah. you, you know, that there is the kind of the, the evil lurks within and the secrets, and they've all killed often for quite banal reasons, greed, jealousy, anger, whatever. You know, they're not serial killers. They're not maniacs. They're not dictators. They're, they are ordinary people whose, whose very human flaws have just taken them a little bit step too far. And I think that's what makes that – I mean, that book is an incredibly bleak book book to it read. is but it's also the it's also the book that seems to be certainly of the novels that i've read that seems to be most about what it's like to write a detective novel it turns out that one of the 10 
uh, was actually innocent all along and has structured the whole thing to kill yeah. people off, to, in a way, create a mystery that people will want to solve, that will attract attention. And in that sense, that character seems to me the closest to Agatha Christie herself. Yes, that's a nice way of putting it. That, because some of the, so many of the books are very self-conscious, aren't they? But that's part of the ethos, that people are always playing parts. And yeah. um, I suppose you can say in some sense the detective is the narrator. But, you, I mean, in Roger Ackroyd, obviously, the murderer is the narrator. The murder yeah. has created that. I mean, you are in the murderer's mind. He has created the whole kind of mise-en-scene. And Roger Ackroyd is so fascinating because it's the 1920s. Absolutely nobody in Roger Ackroyd is who they th say they are. So they've all got secrets. There's the... You know, the country squire actually turns out to be an entrepreneur who's a self-made man or something like that. I can't remember all the details. And Poirot is one of them. Poirot is there. People think he's there growing cucumbers or something, and he turns out to be this detective. Um, but it doesn't really take Poirot to solve it, does it? Because it's the, um, the narrator. You know, the narrator has left you. And this is the brilliance of Christie, actually, the linguistic brilliance. There is just a kind of ellipsis or something, or there's a gap between two sentences. Yeah. Uh, and there's no yeah. way when you're reading that because you're so attentive to language. There's no way that you would notice that when you're reading it. Um, but obviously, once you've got to the end and you've you've realised how perfectly it all fits together, um, then you can go back and read it. I think with enormous pleasure, actually, to work out yeah. how she how she tricked you because she doesn't because it, but yes because she does obey the rules. Yeah, he's not lying. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Everything he says is true. So I think the interesting thing is, so the Roger, Roger Ackroyd is now almost 100 years old. Um, and people are still producing Agatha Christie adaptations in a way they aren't with, let's say, Dorothy L. Sayers. There's no series of Lord Peter Whimsey stories. And the only way of doing that would be to just do them straight. So people wearing spats and sort of, uh, sort mm. of Jeeves and Worcester style. What is it, do you think, Tom, about Agatha Christie that, um, you know, people, there's just been a Why Didn't They Ask Evans adaptation written by Hugh Laurie. There's obviously the Kenneth Branner films. There's, there are French TV series running all the time. What is it that's meant that she survived the 20th century into the 21st? I think it's the beauty of the plotting. And I think it's the understated moral starkness and yeah. coherence that frames that plot. And I think it's a combination of those two. I think the moral climate is really interesting because we don't normally talk about evil now. Um, and most, I would guess, most contemporary 21st century detective novels uh, very much rely on kind of social explanations for evil, don't they? Do you think? I mean... Yeah, or psychological ones. Yeah. So serial killers, it's all, you know, Science of the Lambs, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Do that again, please, for the <laughs> listeners. <laughs> That's terrible. So, um, <laughs> so the, the, um, the, the, the key to depravity and evil lies in well it wouldn't even be evil is, is it i mean it's 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 either illness or it's society it's it's wrongs that have been done to people when they were young or yeah yeah that kind of stuff or if you're rd lang it, illness is caused by society so yeah. um so so i think that to a degree the kind of the charge of of agatha christie appeals to nostalgia to that extent is true i think Nostalgia for a lost moral order. A kind, uh, yes, a, a moral order in which everyone accepts certain moral fundamentals. She's morally unsparing in her disapproval of l lies, greed, adultery. Yeah, infidelity. Exactly. Yeah. All those. <laughs> yeah. In a way that is unfashionable, but is maybe people crave that. I suppose. I also think it's because the, you can do them without the period trappings in a weird way, because she's such a spare writer. Yeah. compared with her predis uh, contemporaries. You don't need to kind of immerse yourself in well, Stanley Baldwin's isn't Britain. It? To... Yes, also, I mean, the, the Second World War is such a kind of firebreak in British social history. Um, and the world of the Attlee government is obviously profoundly different to the world of anyone for tennis. Um, yeah. Before that, I mean, it's, it's quite tough for her target class, you know, the, the upper middle classes, the middle classes. They have it quite tough in austerity Britain. Yeah. I mean, obviously not as well, they think, everyone else. Well, they think but they do. Yeah, they, they definitely think, they, think do. they do. But but that's she she makes she works again with that very cleverly and subtly. So unlike PG Woodhouse, where nothing changes. Nothing changes. You know, yeah. the, the, the world of Blanding's Castle or the Drones Club carries on as though there hasn't been a war and there hasn't been a, a, a Labour government. With with Christie it does. And so the, also, to that extent, her novels are kind of interesting as a... I think absolutely. Uh, so I think if you take a book like um, A Murder is Announced, so that's published in 1950, and that, I think, is one of the best 
Because It's So Subtly Done is one of the best books about reading about middle class discontent with the Atlee government after the Second World War. So, you know, everybody is, they, they all are sort of a bit scratchy, kind of complaining that they have, you know, it's a world of ration books and identity cards and you don't really know who anybody is anymore. There are, you know, it's, taxes are so high. Um, new people have moved into the village and they say they did stuff in the war, but you just don't really know. Um, people beginning to come back from the empire at this point. So this is just a sort of sense of of anxiety and unease. And of this sort of, you get this impression, brilliantly done. I think it's also there, actually. Another book that written decades later, Sarah Waters wrote a book called The Little Stranger, A Ghost Story, which I think also captures the sort of, the sense of these kind of tweedy people that their Britain has been lost um, in this new world of the welfare state and so on. And it's not done to be kind of really outspoken and vociferous about it, but they're unhappy because their world has, has changed. And Christie captures that and she weaves that into the murder plot in a way that's really clever, I think. I mean, I think in the 60s, She's like, but what is it? Bertram's Hotel. A Bertram's Hotel, and <laughs> sort of some of, of the sort of this one, yeah. this Hickory Dickory Dock, I think it is, which is set in um, a hostel for young people, and they're listening to transistors, and then mm. yeah, the music is sort of fifteen years out of date or something. Yeah, um, and, and there's Marple and Dolly Birds. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't quite, it yeah. doesn't quite work. But I think certainly between the nineteen twenties and the nineteen end of the nineteen fifties, the books are a brilliant mirror because they're so subtle. You know, not a sort of uh, they don't bang you over the head with it, but she traces in a way that very few other writers of her time did so successfully the sort of social and cultural changes of mid-century Britain. Well, so there you go. I think that uh, we've justified having Agatha Christie on a history podcast. Do you know, Tom, The most ex- some of the most exhilarating reading experiences in my life have been with Agatha Christie's. And I'm not talking about recently, but when I was sort of 12 or something, I really would skip meals to because Poirot was you know, in your dulcet tones was just as I imagined it um, was uh, (laughs) telling people to assemble in the library, you know, tell the suspects. And I just would think I would rather do, I, I, there's nowhere I'd rather be than reading this right now and finding out who the murderer was. Well, Dominique, I summoned the listeners to the drawing room, to the library. And I feel that now we have revealed the answer. What was the answer? Christianity. Uh, yeah, and ancient history. <laughs> oh, an amazing, an amazing, amazing revelation. Amazing Who would that have you, guessed? That you found the answer you knew you wanted to find. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have guessed? Um, and on that incredible note, yeah, uh, we've arrived at the solution to the mystery. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, and we will see you back soon for the solution Tom, to I was another mystery. That, that, I thought you had planned this incredibly subtle and elegant ending. But you just sort of gave a very generic, you know, thank you for listening. Goodbye. That's part of my amazing kind of trickery. You okay. were expecting something that you didn't get. Yeah. Well, I was expecting something I didn't get. And that was the ultimate You fell twist. into my postmodern trap. So on that bombshell, goodbye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>